So, I've been trying to troubleshoot some technology all day, and I'm not a very pleased person about how well that troubleshooting has been going, but let's talk about a little C++. So, last class, we kind of left off with a little bit of discussion of some data types and integer data types, um, whole numbers, and double data types. This is the old style initializer. Let me change that to the new style. But double is our floating point data type that we'll use most frequently. So that's a little better initializer. And the same story here. You'll notice those old style initializers work, but I'm suggesting we're not going to use those in C++. When we go to C, we will use that older style initializer. So that uh, is something to keep in mind. So after we create a little bit of data, now we have some assignment statements. And there's nothing real new about these assignment statements, but let me space that out a little bit. So this first assignment statement, you notice the operator here, that's the assignment operator. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. This is the addition operator. Now these operators are all binary operators, two operands. So in this particular case, we have the two operands Z and 100.0, and we're adding those together. Obviously, Z being 1.1, you take the 1.1, you add it to 100, and I'm kind of thinking I get 101.1. So the result of this addition operation is then assigned to this memory location. And this memory location happens to be Z again. So effectively, that changes Z, of course. And then let's take a look. We do the same thing here. We have X plus 100 x being 99 I'm thinking that would be 199 which then gets assigned to x now this next statement is a little more interesting because this next statement we have two operands that are different the z of course is a double and the x of course is an int so this is this is a little bit of a problem for C and C++ because C and C++ want to do operations with apples to apples or oranges to oranges. In this case, we have an apple and an orange. So what has to take place in this case is that something has to be converted. In other words, the z could be converted to an int, so we have an int plus an int, or the x could be converted to a double, and we'd have a double and a double. But let's talk about which one makes the most sense. If we take the z and convert it to an int, that of course means you're going to truncate anything that's in the fractional part of that number. So in this particular case, it would just chop off the point 0.1 and you'd be left with just the 1. Now, losing information like that is not a good idea. Whereas if we take the x and convert that to a double, well, we would wind up with 99.0. In other words, we won't lose anything by converting the int to a double. So that's indeed what takes place. And the process is a little bit complex. The value in our variable x is temporarily copied into a temporary variable that the compiler keeps track of and you can never see unless you look at the compiled code for this program. So the x is copied into a temporary variable. You just call it temp. But it's copied into a double. And then the z is added to that temporary variable. So we would get z plus the value in the temporary variable. So whatever's in z, the 1.1, plus the value in the temporary variable, which would be the 99, would now both be doubles, and you'd do a double addition. And that result then is put into another temporary variable, which, of course, is assigned finally to the memory location z. So I'm thinking to myself that if I run this, and I print the value of, of z, well, that's 99 plus the 1.1. So what am I thinking? I think that's 101. I'm going to go ahead and run that and see what I get. And you didn't see the result because I'm not recording. Well, no, I am. I can drag that window down here. So there's the result, the 199, and it says x. Well, why did it do that? It's because I didn't recompile the program. I simply ran what my last compilation was. So that was a bit of a surprise. Let's try that again. This time I'm going to hit this little button that says rebuild it, or I could build it right here with the 
little gear tool. But let's just hit the build and run and see what we get. Now that's a little bit better. Now it says Z is 301. Where'd that 300 come from? 300.1. I've got to take a look at that. And I'm sure that it'll be well explained by my code. Let's take a look. All right. Well, I'm having trouble getting rid of this window here. <laughs> I'll try. There we go. Um, all right. So <laughs> X was 99 and Z was 1.1. And oh, look at that. I said add 100 to Z, 100.0. And then I did the same thing here with my X. Add 100 to my X. So the program did exactly what I said, but I wasn't paying attention. So did you catch that before I ran it? So Z was 100 and 1.1 x was 199 and then i added those two values together and i got my result so that was a little bit of a surprise but it was a good surprise i liked what happened there so let's go ahead and uh, do some more examples but before i do that i want to uh, talk about one thing and that is we had a question the other day in class about using the string class in other words, I could type in a string variable here. Uh, maybe we call that name. And then the initializer. The initializer lists the curly braces. In this case, I don't have to put anything inside the curly braces because the string class, that's part of the standard templates library, knows how to initialize itself to an empty string. And so if all we want to start with is an empty string, we can just go ahead and leave it just the way you see there. Now you'll notice that um, I'm not going to get a compilation error when I hit the build button here. So I just hit the build button and we can take a look at the output and it says uh, warning unused variable Y. It's telling me I'm not using Y. I'm not sure why it didn't warn me about that string variable that I didn't use either. But I didn't get a compilation error. And so you're like, why does it know about the string class? Well, the answer that I found out was the string class was included in IO stream because something in the IO stream class wanted to use string. So the recommendation is, if you're going to use the string class, do a pound sign include and include it. Because if you write a program someday that does not include another library that includes the string class, then you'll be out of luck if you don't include it yourself. So it's a good habit to always include the string class explicitly. Now let's just, let's just test that out real quickly. And uh, let's say that maybe I wanted to input the uh, a person's name all right so I could I could prompt for that I could say see out um, you know, name please and I'll put a little space inside my literal string there and I'm gonna end the line because I don't want to put a line break there because I want the person's input to be captured right on the same line so now I'll do a C in and notice how the chevron there goes the other direction and I'm gonna input from the from the console into the variable name all right so now I should have just done a little bit of input output um, inputting that string from the user now let's go ahead and uh, let's put the person's name in here how about that and let's let's interject it right in there after the word hello so I'm going to end the string that starts with the H and hello there and then I'm going to output name and then I want to output my the rest of my string here so I need to uh, start it with the quote mark and then if I put a space right in front of the C in cruel that'll give me a little space around the name when it gets printed and now I'm going to do is see if that works okay so uh, let's build that and run it and there it's running and let me drag this down where you can see it so now it says name please I'll type in my name and hit enter so hello Peter cruel world and uh, it does everything that it did before also all right so we did kind of what we expected now let me show you one other thing when we when we do a CN into a name here the CN is designed with the string class to essentially scan for some letters not white space and then when it hits white space, it stops scanning. So let's run that again. And this time I'll type in my first and last name. 
All right, I'll get this window and drag it down again. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that, but there we go. Type in Peter Casey and hit enter. And notice it only grabbed the Peter because it scanned over until it found the P, then read in letters until it hit the white space between my names. Let's try one more run of that. This time I'm gonna type in a bunch of spaces before I type my name. So space, 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 maybe even hit the tab key a couple times, type in my name, type in space, 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 doesn't matter, type in my last name and hit enter. And notice it still only grabbed Peter because it skipped over the white space to find the input, then stopped when it hit the space after the R in my name. So just keep that in mind about how the CN works when you're inputting into a string like that. Now what would happen if I do a C in and I'm inputting like an integer? Is it going to do something similar? Well, let's test that out. Let's say, for instance, that instead of using the 99, I'm going to prompt for a number. And I'll input a number into X. Okay, so let's do that. Let's prompt. So I'll do a C out. And I'll prompt for a number. Colon space, just to get the space there. Semicolon on the end. so the input is going to be on the same line. C in, and I'm going to input into my variable x. All right. And now um, I've got to think a little bit about what's going on here. I'm going to comment out this y variable that I'm not using. I'll just put a slash slash in front of that. And then I have my double, and then my x plus 100, and so on. So things are starting to get a little bit confusing. But what if I, uh, what if I comment out this line that increments x by 100? and keep things kind of simple let's go ahead and leave the z plus 100 so what's my starting value for z um, where's my z there it is right there so it's 1.1 so it's 100.1 and i'm going to add x to that okay so whatever i uh, input for x um, is going to determine what the output will be here so let's say that we've got 100.1 uh, because of our z and let's say i put in a 10. so it should be 111.1 i'm thinking if it works all right let's try that all right so it's prompting me for my name i'll just go ahead and type my name hit enter uh, and now it's asking for the number so let's put in a 10 hit enter and 111.1 excellent did what we thought now, let's try this with the space again, though. All right, so I'm going to run it again. And this time, I'm going to put in a bunch of spaces in front of the number. OK, space, 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 tab, 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 bunch of white space all the way over here. And let's put in the 10 again. There it is. And hit Enter. So I notice it did the same thing. You see, it skipped over all the white space until it came to something. And it stops when it hits white space. All right, you can play around with that. I would suggest you play around a little bit with double, too. Now, that's an example, then, of basically doing input and output with our basic data types. In other words, we have a string, and it, strings are very useful in a program, as you can imagine. We had an integer, and then we had a double. With strings, integers, and doubles, you can write a lot of programs. And uh, a lot of programs that do interesting things, in fact. So just with these three types of data, we can do a lot. Now, obviously, we might want to explore more types of data in the future, which certainly we're going to. <laughs> but right now, you can do a lot just with those three data types. Another thing I want you to notice is I did use a little bit of white space here in my program. I have a blank line right here, uh, line 11, a blank line. That helps you know, kind of separate some things. And so white space is very useful. I also want you to notice that my indenting here, I indented the body of my main function. Indenting, one indent, you know, this is just, a, you can either use spaces or tabs to get that consistent indenting. Um, this is a critical, and you definitely need to start that habit right off the bat. Another thing I want you to notice is that around my operators, so here's my stream insertion operator. It's inserting things into the output stream. Notice I put white space around that operator also. And this operator right here, this is the stream extraction operator. It's extracting things from the input stream, which in this case, of course, was the keyboard. But again, notice the white space around that. Uh, down here, when I did my, my math, 
I have my addition operator. There's white space on either side of that operator. And indeed, on the assignment operator, there's white space on either side of that assignment operator. This essentially is not optional. This is pretty much mandatory when you type in your code. So if you're going to try to get lazy on me and leave those gaps out, uh, those spaces out, uh, I'm going to basically tell you you're doing it wrong. So you might as well just get in the habit of doing this. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because your job one is to create code that's easy to read. And this type of white space usage makes your code easier to read. So don't even hesitate to write code that looks good. If you're lazy or you're a bad typer for some reason, you're not doing it, um, you need to get over that because that's not acceptable uh, to write poorly formatted code. So let me introduce another topic that we talked about in class on Thursday, and that is I wanted to break my program up into some smaller pieces because every time I run this piece you see here, it did everything. In other words, maybe I just wanted to practice inputting a number, but it actually ran the business with inputting the string. It also ran all the business down here of, of doing that little addition with the integer and the double. And so I'm thinking to myself, it'd be kind of nice if I could split some of this stuff out into separate little functions so that I don't have to run it all at the same time. So let me just talk about that. So the basic form for a function is your function is going to have a return type. And in this particular case, I don't want my function to return anything. So for the return type, in this case, I'm going to type the word void. That's a reserved word in the language. It means don't return anything. The next thing I, I do is I'm going to type in the, uh, the name of my function. So I'm just going to type make up a function name here, and I'm going to say funct01. Um, so the return type, the name of the function, and then every function has to have a parameter list. Now the parameter list basically is indicated with a set of parentheses. And a function that has no parameters will have an empty set of parentheses. A function that needs information passed in to do some work will have the parameters inside those parentheses. And I'll give you an example of that in just a minute. The final part of a function, of course, then, is the body of the function. And the body of the function is indicated with the open and close curly braces. So I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of enters there. And here we have sort of the classic simple function template, if you will. It's got the return type. It's got the name of the function. It's got the parameter list, in this case empty. And then it's got the body of the function. Now notice a couple of things before I go on. The parameter list follows immediately after the function name with no space. All right. The body of the function follows after the parameter list, but indeed there is a space after the parameter list and before the open curly brace. Now in this particular case, you might notice that I put my open curly brace at the end of that function header. That is a very popular style. Um, as you notice down below with main, you could do it with the open and close curly braces lined up on top of each other like I just did. This is a personal preference. I think that the open curly brace on your function at the end of the function header is more common, much more common in programming. And the reason for that, of course, is it doesn't introduce an additional blank line. Like that blank line you notice that you see up here, on, uh, down here on main. Now my style, again, would be to put that with a single space right at the end of the line like that. Now, I don't really care on this one which style you prefer, but you just want to be consistent. Come up with a style that works and that seems to be uh, meet the standard of easy to read and then stick with it. So let me demonstrate then my little function right here. So I'm going to change my name to something like uh, demo string. All right, demo string. And I'm going to take the declaration and everything that I did here in line 11, 12, and 13, and even all the way down to 14 to get that output. I'm going to take all those lines of code take them out of main, and I'm going to just click it right here on line 7. I'm clicking on the line number there. And paste, and now it's all in my demo string. Now at this point, you notice I still have a whole bunch of code in main, 
that every time I run my code, it's going to run this code in main, and I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another function real quickly. So in this particular case, my function, I'll just, again, void, and I'll call this demo numbers, empty parameter list, open curly brace, and it the comp editor environment gives me the closing curly brace. And then I'm just going to hit enter a couple times and get that blank space there. And now I want to grab all this code from line 19 all the way down to line 31. That's all with the numbers practice there. And I'm going to chop that out of there. So I'm going to control X that out of there. And now I'm going to come back up here to my demo numbers routine. And I just clicked on the 15 there to highlight that blank line and paste. And now I've got demo numbers all in its own little function and nothing in main. Now, if I run this program, it won't do anything. You'll notice it didn't do anything. It just immediately quit. So I'm going to go ahead and press the key to close that screen. And now let's try demo numbers. And so to call a function, you give the name of the function and you type in its parameter list. You have to have the parameter list. You can kind of think of the parentheses here as the function call. It's calling the function. And in this case, nothing is being passed to the function. So let's go ahead and rebuild that and run it. And you'll notice then it called the function number P, please. I'll put in my 10, hit enter, printed out the answer we expected, and hit continue. So now my nice little demo numbers runs perfectly. And all I have to do is comment that out with a simple comment slash slash. And now I can try calling my other function. And what did I call that? I called that demo string. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to call that function. Easy enough. Demo string, open close parentheses. That's the parameter list, semicolon on the end of that line. Let's go ahead and build and run that one. And you'll notice that it's working like a champ. I'll go ahead and put in my name, hit enter and it did exactly what we wanted it to do, or expected it to do. So you'll notice now then that all I have to do is comment out that function and it no longer runs, and I'm good to go. So this is the technique you use to break programs up into smaller pieces. And that's one of the big ideas I talked about the other day, of breaking a program up into smaller pieces. So one of the key building blocks then of most programming languages is this notion of creating a function. In some programming languages, they would refer to it as a method or a procedure. All that, all those mean pretty much the same thing. So let me jump back and show you the other idea I was talking about is creating a function called cube. All right, so I'm going to come down here and I'm going to open up a brand new little space there. And a function cube, if you think about it, is a pretty simple idea. You give it a number, it cubes it, and gives you back the result. So in this particular case, our function actually returns something. And so we need a little bit of different syntax to do this. Let's say that I just want to cube a whole number. So it'd be like an integer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in the return type first, because that's always what we type when we type a function. The return type would be int. So I'll go ahead and type my int. And the name of my function, of course, in this case is cube. And then the parameter list. Now, in this case, the parameter list has to have something there because I need to pass a value into the cube function for it to have something to actually cube. So anytime we type in a variable name in C or C++, we have to always proceed it with the data type. So again, I said I wanted to cube an int. So I'm going to say int. And then what's the name of my variable? Very similar to declaring variables in the body of a function. So I'm going to go ahead and put a variable name in there. And it could be anything. Let's just call it value. All right. So there's my parameter list. There's my open, close, curly brace. Hit enter a couple times. Arrow up. And now start typing in the body of my function. Now, this function can be very short. It can just be a, re a return of value times itself a couple times. But let me go ahead and introduce another variable in the body of this function. So let's just go ahead and call that an int, and we'll name this result. And I always initialize variables. In this case, of course, I'm just going to initialize it to a 0, because for lack of anything better, 0 is a good thing to use. And so there is a variable that I'm going to use to store my result. 
I could actually have calculated the cube right inside those curly braces by saying value times value times value, but I want to do this very, very step by step. So let's go ahead and hit enter. And now I want to say result is set equal to my variable that's being passed in times itself a couple times, value times value times value, and a semicolon. And that will, of course, cube value. And then I need to return that. So here's the return statement. So you, you say return keyword. It's a reserved word in both C++ and C. And now you say, what is it you want to return? Well, in this particular case, I want to return the result. So I say return result. And there we go. There's a perfect little cube function for you. Now, a lot of people would write that much more briefly. They just simply say return value times value times value. And they would not have a local variable. They would not have the statement that stores it into that local variable result. And it would just be a one-liner. But I wanted to show you a bunch of different little pieces. Now, I need to test to see if my function works. And so that means I have to call my function. So I'm going to create a, another little function to call it. So I could actually come up here and, and add it to my program up here to test it. But I, I want to just make another little function because it's easy to do and it's good practice. So this function is going to say void. And I want to basically test my uh, cube function. So I'm going to say demo cube. You could say test cube. That might be a good name too. And open close and body of function. Now, what I want to do then is I want to basically do this as simple as possible to test my cube. So all I am going to do is I'm going to create a, a value here. And I'm just going to call this number. And I'm going to initialize that number to, well, anything we want. Let's just initialize it to 3. I could actually prompt the user for this. But I want to keep it short and sweet just to test my cube function. And the easiest way to do that is just initialize my variable to some known value and try it out. So now all I want to do is I want to see out the cube of my of my number there. So I could do something like this. I could say the cube of 3 is, with a space there, and then just call my cube function and pass it the 3. And maybe do the end L on the end, get a line break. And there we go. So I'm saying a literal string, cube of 3 is, and then I call my cube function. And when I call my cube function, it's, it's kind of easy to imagine what's happening here, much like in your math class. If you have a function f of x, and f of x is defined to be equal x times x times x, that'd be pretty much a cube function. And then you say, well, what's f of, f of 3? Well, you'd say to yourself, well, f of 3 is 3 times 3 times 3. You know, that's easy enough. And that's exactly what this compiler is going to do. It's going to call the cube function. It takes the 3. And it simply passes it on down here into that placeholder there in my parameter list. So now the value variable here is going to get the value 3. Create the local variable, set it to 0. 3 times 3 times 3. Store that result into the result variable. And then return the result variable. And the result variable and it comes back. And so the value of that function call then would be 3 times 3 times 3, of course, which is 27. So that's what we're hoping this thing actually will output. So now to actually test this thing out, I just call it from main. So down here in main, I'm going to go ahead and add that, whoops, add that call to my function. And it's called demo cube. And uh, you notice my editor picked that out of the list for me and put a semicolon on the end. So there we go. Now, there's a reason this is not going to work, but I, I did it intentionally. So I want to show you what's going to happen when I build this. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the Build button. And I get this error message right here, this, this red this red dot's indicating me I have an error on that line. And, and, I, and I can't see the errors because I have that log window closed. But let's go ahead and view that log window. So here's the log window. Now, it's not very easy to see because it's such a small font. If somebody can figure out how to change the font size in that log window, let me know. Um, I right click. Uh, nothing too magical there. Let's try a scroll bar with the control key, nothing's happening there. But essentially what it says, it says error, cube was not declared in this scope. So what it's saying is, I'm trying to use the cube function here, and it's saying it's not declared, and it, it doesn't know about it. But you're probably sitting at, 
home right now saying, wait a minute, it's right there. Why can't the compiler find it? Well, this is an important concept in C and C++. The way it works in C and C++ is the compiler is going to read the code from the top down. So it includes elements here, includes elements with the string class and keeps reading. It finds this function and therefore it knows about it. it. It adds it to a little dictionary. So it adds demo string to its little dictionary and it says, okay, I know about that. It comes down here and adds demo numbers to its little dictionary. It says, okay, I know about that one. It comes down here to demo cube, adds it to its dictionary. And it also, while it's adding it to its dictionary, it kind of scans down through it and it says, oh, what's this? And it immediately says, eh, I don't know what that is. And at that point, the compilation chokes. So we've got a little bit of a problem. It's, it's not a difficult problem, but this is an important idea you need to keep in mind. The order of things as they appear in your source file is important. So in this case, cube, as you see, was defined below the use of cube. And that was the problem. And so we have two ways to solve this problem. One obvious way would be to take the cube function and cut it right out of here and move it above its use. And now that problem is going to go away. And I can demo that, of course, by building it. I'll hit build. And I'll hit build. There we go. And notice the problem went away. It's just telling me that I have an unused variable somewhere in my program. Uh, right here, I have an unused variable because I didn't use it. And I'm like, wait a minute, I hard-coded the number right there. Okay, well, that was silly of me. Notice I got a little round dot here indicating it's not a, a fatal error, it's a warning. So I'm going to fix that up. Some of you at home probably noticed that. Um, okay, I would name names here, but I'll avoid doing that. So let's go ahead and put our variable in there. Let's build this again. And notice no warnings, no errors. That is the goal you want to reach. You want to get rid of warnings. You want to get rid of errors. Uh, maybe that little red dot was not what I thought it was. I'll just click that. Oh, maybe that's a breakpoint. That's probably what it is. Okay. So now my program is all ready to run and I can actually run that. Let's go ahead and run that. And notice it cube of 3 is 27. Perfecto. Did what we thought. Now, that solved the problem. But let me go back and show you the alternative way I can solve that problem. So I'm going to put it back where it was. Probably could have done an undo, undo there, but let's put it back where it was. And again, let's build it. And big error. Doesn't know about cube because it hasn't seen it yet. So the way we can solve this in C and C++, which is actually very common, and uh, you might be kind of wondering why you'd ever bother doing it, but I'll talk about that in just a minute. The way we solve that is we take the header of our function. The header is what you see highlighted right there. And I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to scroll up to the top of my program. And notice I have a bunch of pound sign includes here. Well, those pound sign includes are including a bunch of headers. Well, in this particular case, I don't want to include a header. I have the file, it's right here inside my source. But I want to tell C++ about this function. I want to tell it about this function because it's having trouble with that particular issue. So you'll notice in this particular case then, I just copied the header of the function and pasted it with a semicolon on the end. So now what we would call this is a declaration. That's a declaration of the function it tells the compiler several things. It tells it about the return type. It tells it, of course, about the name of the function. And it tells it about the parameter list. In this case, the parameter list includes a single int. So those three pieces of information are what the compiler needs to know to simply know how it can utilize the function. Later, of course, it's going to have to have the definition of the function. But this declaration gives it enough to work with. So watch when I build this. No errors, no warnings, no nothing. Because it knows about cube. And so when it gets down here where cube is used, it says, oh, I know all about that. It's going to return an int. This parameter is going to be, it needs to be an int. And it says, I'm a happy camper. 
Now, if I had not included the definition of the function somewhere in this source file, it would have then given me a different error. It would have said, hey, wait a minute. I don't have the definition of the function. I got the declaration, thank you, but I don't have the definition of the function, so I can't compile. In fact, we could comment that out, but I'm not going to do it right now. You could comment that out, for instance, and see what it would do when you tried to build it without the definition of the function. Oh, right. I know you wanted to see it. So I'm going to comment that out with a multi-line comment tag. The multi-line comment tag uh, basically is a slash asterisk, asterisk slash. Now let's hit the build button and see what happens. Oh, now it's saying undefined reference to cube undefined. In other words, it knew about cube, but the body of it was not defined. So that was kind of what I expected. Error messages are vary from environment to environment, but let me undo um, and undo and rebuild that and we're back in action. So this is something that we will explore a lot going forward. And in fact, what I should have done just to be really precise, I should have copied all of my functions and put their declarations up here at the top. And so I'll go ahead and do that right now. And it doesn't really matter what order the declarations are in, of course, because all we're seeing in this list is simply the declaration of the function header with no code. So there's there are all three of those. Now, I'm not going to do it tonight, but in the future, what we're going to be doing when we create a source file with functions in it is what we'll do is we will create a .h header file that includes this information. And so anyone who wants to use my code would import or include, as you see at the top there, they would include the .h file, which grabs all of the headers, and that would allow their code then to be compiled. And when we start compiling multi-file programs, you'll see how that works. But this is essentially what we do. Now, this means that I could put my functions that you have here, I could put these in any order. In fact, you know, I could put these below main, which is very common actually in C and C++. So here, here are my various functions. I'll just cut those all out of there. And now I'll park them below main. So now that I've got them all below main, well, when I come to main, it's calling demo cube and it says, well, what's demo cube? Well, it knows what demo cube is because the headers of all my functions are declared right here. And in fact, it knows all about demo numbers again, because oops, demo numbers. I didn't do it. I did demo cube and I did cube but I didn't do demo numbers so in fact let me build this and notice the error message demo numbers is not declared so some of you may have noticed that mistake at home bravo for you I'll go down and grab the demo numbers function header some people call this the function signature I'll go ahead and copy that and I'll scroll up here and I have a nice place for it paste it right there oops lost my line break but let me go ahead and fix that up now it knows about it i'll go ahead and rebuild error goes away and i'm a happy camper again so this notion then of breaking your program up into smaller pieces is huge it's huge it's a big idea and you've seen some small examples of this you can actually do this in your programs for instance if there are three or four programming exercises you could do it all with one source file and just create a function for each exercise make it a void call it exercise two underscore three or something like that you can't use a dot in your file names in your function names but you could use an underscore no parameter list of course and then just put all the body for that all the code for that exercise in the body of your function and then simply call your function from main like i'm doing here now again, depending on what order you put them in, if you put your functions above main, you won't need to declare, or yes, you won't need to declare your function headers first because it would be found 
as long as it's above main. But you might want to experiment with this and put your functions below main, and then you'd have to, of course, copy the function's header and put it up above as a declaration so main knows what it's talking about when you actually try the compilation. So this is something to look into. Okay. I'd ask if you have any questions right now, but uh, yeah, you're not in the room with me, so that isn't going to happen. All right. Let's talk about another topic, of course, that's in Chapter 2. Actually, these functions were not in Chapter 2, but I encourage you to explore this. It's quite simple, and you're going to be doing a lot of it. Again, if you don't want to do these functions, you don't have to at this point. But the next topic that I want to explore, and I'm going to go ahead and do the function header here first, is I'm going to say demo operators. And then I'm going to take what I just typed, I'm going to copy that and I'm going to come on down here below main and I'll just paste that right in there and on the end down here I need to open curly brace close curly brace couple enter just an enter and enter and then a little space between my functions again notice closing bracket beginning function blank line do it so let's just do some simple things here Declare an int uh, x and give it a value of uh, 4, easy enough. Uh, int y, give it a value of 45. And uh, let's just uh, do a couple things here. For starters, let's just do an assignment statement. Um, let's say x is set equal to x plus y. Simple enough. Now, again, I'm going to just use some terminology here I want you to get used to, and that is we want to talk about that as an operator. We want to talk about x and y as operands. So y and uh, plus, in this case, is a binary operator. x and y are the two operands. All right. Now we also have an assignment operator, and I want to talk a little bit about this one. The assignment operator is not equals you don't want to think equals you don't want to say equals when you talk about it so if you were to read this statement to me i would not want you to say x equals x plus y algebraically folks that can never be true so you don't want to say that <laughs> now <laughs> I guess you could say it could possibly be true if X and Y were both zero. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's a little weird. <laughs> okay, so don't say that. You want to say something like X is assigned the value of X plus Y, or X gets the value of X plus Y, or the value of X plus Y is placed into X. X represents a computer's memory location and so you can think of it as a place for a value to be placed. And so X is a, a destination if it's on the left-hand side of that assignment operator. X actually represents an address if it's on the left-hand side of that assignment operator. It's the address of where to put something in memory, all right? Now let me contrast that for just a minute with something that the author used in the, uh, in the textbook. The author demonstrated an if statement. So I could say if, and then the test I want goes inside parentheses. I can say if x is greater than zero, then do something. And then open curly brace. So you, all, you always want to put the open and close curly brace on your if statements. It's not absolutely required if it's a single statement after the if, but it's good style and good practice to always use them. So do that. Always use the open close curly braces. So here I could say something like, you know, see out um, something simple. The value of x is greater than zero. Spell it out maybe. All right, and maybe, I don't know, do an endel on the end there. All right. So here's a very simple little example with, with a lot going on. Um, And we could actually test this little thing real quickly. There's something I want to talk about here in just a minute, but let's let's before we go any further, let's test this really quickly. Now to test this, I need to call this function 
from main. So I need to call this from main. So I'll go ahead and copy that. And main, as you remember, is, is just right up above. So I'll dash that, slash slash that, that function. In. And I'll go ahead and paste that in there, put a semicolon in the end. So now, first things first, I'm going to build it and see if I have any errors. And uh, I'll look at the log window here. And uh, whoopsie, I'm, I'm typing a bunch of numbers. I'm not hitting the right key. <laughs> not an F2. And no errors, no warnings, no nothing. I'm a happy camper. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And drag that over so you can see it. The value of x is greater than 0. And so it did what I expected. That's important. So let's let's take another look. See, so 4 plus 45, of course, is 49, and that's greater than 0. Now, let's change our if test a little bit. And let's actually change it to compare to see if it's equal to 0. Equal, equal. Aha. And I'll change my output here to equal, equal. Now, you'll notice that when I said equals to, I actually did say equals, equals. And many people would actually read it that way. They might, you know, when they're reading their C or C++ code, they'll say if x equal, equals 0. And so that's, there's nothing wrong with that because it really, you know, pushes home that point that we're talking equality here. Again, as a reminder, if I was to read this statement out loud, I would say x gets the value of x plus y, or x is assigned to x plus y. Please do not say equals when you're looking at an assignment operator. So assignment operator is very different visually, as you can see here, from the equality operator. The equality operator is a relational operator, and the relational operator is going to return true or false. Now, I'm going to demonstrate to you something that if I if I accidentally leave off the second equality operator, well, now I have an assignment state operation here. I can't call that a statement. It's simply an assignment operation. The assignment operator is a binary operator. It's got two operands. The leftmost operand has to be what they call an L value. It has to represent an address in the computer's memory because it's doing assignment. It's going to do storage. The right-hand side can be pretty much anything. They would call that an RHS, or right-hand side value. So in this particular case, it's going to say uh, x gets the value of 0, or x is assigned the value of 0. So then I have a question for you. What is the value of that operation? Well, if I ask you what the value of that operation is, that binary operator plus, you'd say, well, in this case, it's 45 plus 4 which of course is 49. That's not any big deal. It's, it's addition. You know that. But what is the value of that expression? That expression actually does have a value. The value of this assignment expression is the value of what gets assigned. So the value of this assignment expression is 0. Well, unfortunately, in my book, unfortunately, in C and C++, the integral value 0 means false, and non-zero means true. So that means this if statement, if it executes, is, is going to assign 0 to x, and the value of that expression will be 0, which means false. This will always be false. Always be false. It can never be anything but false, because you're doing assignment here, not equality. So that is a major bug in a lot of people's programs. Now, I'm going to show you one little thing the author didn't do, and that is I'm going to put an else clause on my if. In other words, the if statement says, is this true? And if it's true, do what's inside my curly, bra my curly braces here. But if it's not true, you can add an optional else clause. And I typically format this. There's lots of ways to format it. But I typically format it like that with the else on a line by itself. So this demonstrates very clearly that we've got the true statement here, if the test is true, and we've got the false statement or statements. We would call this a block, the true block and the false block. So I can put a very simple statement in here. You know, I could say something like, uh, see out, you know, uh, the if, test is false. All right. And uh, 
So if I run this, because what I've just told you, the result of this expression, this assignment is zero, which means false in C and C++, um, that is going to essentially um, turn into uh, false, and it's going to come down here and do that. All right, let's, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and build and run this thing. And it says the if test is false. Uh, falsed. So that's a little bit bizarre. But it did what we thought. Let's go ahead and fix that and get rid of that D. Now, how about if um, I actually put a zero in here? You're saying, well, what if you actually put a zero in there? So I'll actually assign a zero to my X and I'll run it again. And uh, it says if X is assigned the value of zero. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Um, well, let's just run it and see what happens. Okay, build and go. And we get the same thing. The if test is false. Okay, I expected that. Did you? Let's do equals equals. Now that is equality. If x equal equals zero. And that's going to return a true. All right, it returns true. It doesn't return an integer. It returns a Boolean true. So C and C++ allow you to use these Boolean values. Actually, C doesn't really have a Boolean value. C++ does. And so that actually returns a new data type Boolean, which is true, which means it should print out the value of x is equal to equal zero. Uh, let's see what happens. I'll build and run. And indeed, the value of x is equal to equal zero. Perfecto. Did what we thought. So that demonstrated um, a very important point about using the correct operator for comparing versus assigning. And again, I want to stress the use of the proper language when you talk about it. All right. Now, let me show you a couple more relational operators. If you want to do greater than, that's what it looks like. If you want to do less than, that's what that looks like. If you want to do greater than or equals to, that's what it looks like. Less than or equal to. That's what that looks like. You know about equals equals. And finally, the last one is not equals. So those are the relational operators. And indeed, I want you to use the terminology properly. Relational operators. All of those operators are binary operators. That means they have two operands and they all return a Boolean, which means a true or false value. Boolean, named after George Boole. Look him up. Famous mathematician. All right. So I'm going to comment this line out because I don't want it there. It won't compile. All right, so I commented that line out. The last thing we could talk about would be some other operators. And the other operators um, don't really require a lot of conversation. The addition operator we've talked about, the subtraction operator. We also know the multiplication symbol is the asterisk, so that's the multiplication operator. The division operator. Uh, is the forward slash. That's a little new to some people. The forward slash is leaning forward to the right. Don't confuse that with the backslash. And then a couple of other operators that might be new to people. Um, well, one other operator actually. Let's see, what am I missing here? Multiplication, division. The remaindering operator is the percent sign. And the remaindering operator basically takes a value and divides and gives you back the remainder. Now this is something you all did many, many years ago, and you're probably not too familiar with these days. But uh, it's an easy, easy, easy operation to understand. Comment that out. Let's just do a real quick remaindering operation here. Uh, I've got a couple of operands up here. i got x and y, so I could use those two. So let's just do a quick C out. And we'll output the 45 remainder of 4. And my question would be, what is the remaindering operator going to give me with 45 remainder 4? Well, how many times does 4 go into 45? Well, that's pretty obvious. It goes in 11 times. Well, if it goes in 11 times evenly, that means I get 44, and I got one left over. That's the remainder. So we ought to probably get a 1 if I run this. Let's go ahead and give that a try. And indeed, I got the 1 which I expected. So the remaining operator is simply the remaining operator here that would 
cause any kind of confusion whatsoever. Now, before we go any further, though, I do want to talk about the division operator. Now, the division operator, there's two copies of the division operator. In fact, there's actually two copies of essentially all the operators except the remaindering one. Um, and in fact, let me demonstrate what I mean by that. If, if I try to do the remaindering operator with a double, with a floating point value, let me try to build that and see what happens. And it says, no, you can't do that. Down here it says error invalid operands of type int and double to a binary operator remainder. Um, and so it's got a little bit of a problem there. Even if these were both doubles, I'll go ahead and just hard code two doubles in there. Let's build that again. Same error. You can't use the remaindering operator with double data types. And so uh, again, uh, this whole notion of, well, what happens when I have an int and a double? Well, of course, apples and oranges, folks. It had to take a copy of this int and put it into a temporary double variable and then try to do the operation. So let me show you what happens when I do division with integers. So 45 divided by 4. So you might be tempted to think the result's going to have a fractional part. But if I run this, you'll notice that I did not get a fractional part. I got the whole number 11. That's because integer division gives you an integer result. Always. Integer division gives you an integer result. Now let's do it with a double. So all I do is I change that 4 to a, to a 4.0. And now I have a double. And I have apples and oranges. What's going to do? Well, of course, it's going to make a temporary variable out of that 45. That's a double. And then it's going to do the double division. And double division, of course, I've got fractional values there. It's going to do pretty much what you expect. It's going to create a double result. And there it is, 11.25, just like you thought. So when I do mixed math, of course, a conversion is going to take place. You can't really do mixed math. It'll convert the data types first. That's why it's so important to know what you're working with. If you're working with ints, great. If you're working with doubles, great. If you're working with ints and doubles, know what's going to happen. It's going to do a conversion of that int to a double before it does the math. So you realize then, of course, that the double operator is going to be dependent upon your data types. And that's something that you just got to remember. And that's one of those small details that's in Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is not hard conceptually. It's just got a lot of detail. So please read it carefully. Do all the exercises you can bear to do, and then do a few more. Practice code. Try things out. Practice, practice, practice. I'm running out of gas, so I'm going to stop there. If you have any questions about any of this, you know what to do. Send me some email. Have a great weekend.